Hello, we're here at the Skoll World Forum in Oxford in the UK, and with me is Piyush Tawari, CEO and founder of Save Life Foundation, a social enterprise dedicated to saving lives on India's roads, some of the most dangerous in the world. Piyush, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, according to the WHO, there are 1.9 million road traffic deaths a year globally, and nine out of 10 of fatalities are in low and income countries. Uh, what, what's the scale of the problem in India? And uh, when you researched this issue, what did you find was driving those, um, those fatalities? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as you rightly said, 93% of uh, the global uh, death toll on uh, in road crashes are in the low and middle income countries. Uh, India, uh, unfortunately, uh, has the highest number of fatalities on the roads. I think it's also a factor of population. Uh, but uh, when we look at how severe the crashes are, uh, uh, which is the number of fatalities per 100 crashes, uh, we are amongst the highest in the world. And that, of course, uh, is a significant point of uh, concern. Uh, Save Life Foundation was started in 2008 uh, following uh, the road crash uh, death of a young family member of mine. And what started as a process to respond to uh, him not getting help on the roads uh, eventually evolved into an institution that today has very deep knowledge and understanding about what is causing this in the first place, as you asked. And what we've discovered is that while there are, of course, um, surface level issues around how people drive, what the roads are, so on and so forth, uh, there are very deep seated, deep rooted systemic issues also that surround this issue. Uh, one of the most significant challenges is that of ownership, uh, who takes ownership for this issue. Uh, it's a massive public health issue, uh, but you know, typically transport doesn't fall under the realm of, of public health. So who, who takes charge of it? Roads don't fall under the realm of public health. So there is a significant need to uh, create uh, you know, a platform where different bodies can come together. The second aspect is around allocation of resources. Uh, you know, if it's looked from a, pub a public health lens, you need to be able to allocate significant amount of resources uh, to its redressal. And we've seen that those resources are available. It's just a matter of allocation, the matter of right allocation. Uh, then there are, you know, fundamental issues around data and reporting. How, you know, what's the nature of the problem? How deep is it? How well are we understanding it? So yes, while there are issues around behavior, engineering, enforcement, trauma care, uh, there are, of course, there are, there's a whole bed of deep-rooted deep -rooted issues that are, uh, you know, perpetuating uh, all of the other issues that we, uh, you know, often know about road crashes. Mm. And you're here at the Skoll uh, World Forum as an award winner um, for social innovation. Um, and so how has, social, how has innovation and harnessing new technology helped you achieve impact as an organization? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, firstly, we are deeply, deeply grateful to uh, Skoll for the honor, but also for, uh, you know, being amongst the first uh, global organizations to recognize this issue as a pressing public health issue facing the world today. Uh, so I think that's something that we really are grateful for. And then uh, when it comes to what we've done, uh, we've built a, a simple solution that is called Zero Fatality Corridors uh, that takes into account uh, the fact that if you are able to identify the deadliest roads and implement a suite of interventions which are across uh, road engineering, police enforcement, trauma care, uh, very importantly, and road user behavior change, uh, you are able to see a decline in fatalities on those roads. And uh, we've, of course, used technology quite significantly. We uh, have trained uh, AI to be able to identify conflict uh, on, for example, intersections, and that helps us work with the government to redesign intersections in a way that they become safer for pedestrians, cyclists, and other vulnerable road users. Um, similarly, we use a fair amount of data science to uh, you know, code and analyze police data uh, and pull insights from it and then apply it as part of our work. Uh, so yes, there is a significant use of technology, but uh, the solution fundamentally is to create a cohesive suite of intervention that can be applied on any road in the world uh, with the intention of uh, drastically cutting road fatalities. And I know that you've scaled these corridors uh, around various areas in Indonesia, 
I know that you've scaled these corridors around various areas in India. What plans do you have to, um, to extend those to other countries? Yeah, so uh, we've, we've been very lucky in the way that the government of India has been very forthcoming in partnering with us to scale this model. So uh, we partnered with the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways in India to now take, take this solution nationally um, in partnership with various agencies. Um, and our uh, current goal, therefore, is that now that this is scaling up in India, uh, we can start focusing on some of the other regions of the world where uh, this problem uh, is quite exacerbated. So, for instance, uh, we are taking this uh, outside of India to the immediate neighborhood in uh, South Asia to Bangladesh. Uh, we are looking at Southeast Asia uh, to Thailand, which has the highest number of fatalities on the roads in Southeast Asia. Uh, we are also looking at uh, in uh, in Africa, we're looking at Kenya and Zimbabwe. Uh, both are countries that have a very high amount of highway development happening at this point. And we feel that this is a great time to intervene uh, to prevent any future massive loss of life that might occur with a, with a wider network of uh, highways and expressways. So if we bring in the suite of interventions right now, we can preemptively uh, reduce uh, fatalities. And once we're able to uh, you know, implement this in these geographies, uh, we hope to learn from it. And then once we've learned from it, we then intend to scale this to uh, the entire world, really, to you know, wherever this problem exists. Uh, there, there, there is a defined approach, a defined set of interventions that can lead to, uh, lead to reduction in deaths. And one of the things you're known for is your work in bringing about a good Samaritan law in India. Uh, can you tell us about that? Sure. So, uh, you know, we discovered in 2007, after the loss that I have, uh, I had, uh, is that people who witnessed crashes uh, were traditionally hesitant to come forward and help the injured. And as we found out that this was not apathy that was uh, driving inaction, it was a very profound fear of getting uh, entangled in a legal case, a very prolonged legal case for many, many years. And in some cases to be even blamed for the incident, uh, and especially if there is a fatality that occurs in that incident. So there was a very deep rooted fear in people to come forward and help the injured. And what Save Life Foundation did was that we um, uh, you know, filed a writ petition in the Supreme Court of India uh, asking them to intervene. It was a four year process, got a fair amount of opposition from uh, people whose powers were to be taken away uh, in this process. And, um, but eventually in 2016, we got the Good Samaritan Law in the country to protect and insulate those who wish to come forward and help the injured uh, from any kind of ensuing legal or procedural hassles that they might get into. And what Save Life Foundation is working on today is to expand that to the realm of the entire chain of survival, the entire trauma care, and uh, to look for a legislation that can guarantee trauma care as a fundamental right uh, to all uh, Indians and establish again a model uh, for perhaps other low and middle income countries to look at uh, because trauma care fundamentally preserves the right to life of an injured person uh, and must be guaranteed therefore. Uh, so we are now working uh, you know a, a few steps ahead of what we did with the Good Samaritan Law to look at the entire ecosystem of trauma care and uh, try and bring that uh, as a guarantee to all Indians. And what problems are you seeing around trauma care and uh, is this affecting um, uh, poorer people more? Um, we know that, that low, uh, low income communities are disproportionately yes. affected um, in the fatalities uh, on roads. Yeah. Why is that? So you're absolutely right. We, we uh, recently partnered with the World Bank Group to do a very comprehensive study on the socioeconomic impact of road crashes. And as you rightly said, we discovered that uh, it disproportionately impacts poor families. Uh, when it comes to trauma care, uh, now the challenge is that over the last many years, India has seen a fair amount of improvement in ambulance services. Uh, there are numbers you can call for help. Uh, even hospitals have improved. But fundamentally, what trauma care is about is to link up all of these different things to ensure a seamless chain of survival for an injured person. And what we intend to do with this, with the legislation, is to create that chain, which is currently uh, you know, many of the systems are working in silos. Hospital services, uh, ambulance services don't talk to hospitals. Hospitals have no clue about uh, how the services are being invoked. 
Uh, there are, there are uh, you know, basic systems missing in terms of how do you level the hospitals and designate them uh, from level four to level one trauma centers. So that there are various nuances of this that uh, are missing, even though the country has made some advances in improving some of these services individually. So our intention is to bring them together so that they can work fundamentally to save that life um, without any silos and without any disconnections. Mm -hmm. And uh, with these policy impacts that you've achieved as an organization, um, what would you say is the sort of secret to your success and what advice would you give to other organizations that are trying to achieve these kind of policy changes? Yeah, I think the one big part of our success has been to uh, have our ear to the ground, uh, to constantly talk to the victims, constantly listen to what's happening on the ground. And the second aspect has been that when you combine uh, good data, um, and of course, uh, you know, I think the concept of good data is relative. Uh, but when you combine data with, um, you know, the understanding of what might appeal to a policymaker, uh, what's the, uh, you know, uh, you know, how do they answer the question? What's in it for me? Because of course, everybody has a role to play, and everybody has a job to do. Uh, so how do you make this uh, make your ask relevant for their job that they are supposed to do? I think that is, uh, you know, has been, uh, uh, you know, a great learning for us and, um, and we've been successful at it. And then finally, I would say that, you know, there are various elements that people use in advocacy. Uh, there's media, there's policymakers, there is public, there are influencers uh, and so on and so forth. And one thing that we learned is that when you are looking at causing a shift or a system change, then you have to ensure that all of those different facets of intervention are acting at the same time uh, and not again in silos or not in a uh, disconcerted uh, fashion. Uh, so I think these are a few learnings we've had in terms of how to uh, shift the scale uh, to uh, create change. Yes, thank you so much for joining thank us you. today. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much.